whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, yet there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was will the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul into death and has numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many, making intercessions for the transgressors. Let's pray. And Father God, we thank you that it was your will to send Jesus to do all of this for us. To bear our guilt, our shame, our, our sin, to take our punishment. And for that, we just say thank you. God, I pray that you would help us as we just read this passage to see this is how much you were for us. That we were like sheep who had gone astray and gone our own way, and yet you sent Christ to a rebellious people like us. This is how much you are for us. And I pray that we would not only see it, but that we would celebrate it. That we would celebrate your goodness to wayward sheep like us. And to thank you and praise you for Jesus that this prophecy came true when Christ went to the cross on our behalf. What a gift. What a salvation. What a work of God on our behalf. And for that we say, and as we come now to sing, we thank you and praise you. It's in your name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing, God is for us.
relate to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, we not, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And as we continue to sing, we're going to sing how his mercy is more, more than our sin. And we're going to sing the great cornerstone that Christ is for us, that we continue to remember this is how much God is for us. His mercy is always greater. He is a strong foundation and a cornerstone for us. So let's just continue to sing and celebrate the wonder of just how much and the many ways that God is for us.
with trumpets sound, call me heaven in every
So, Lord, I pray that you would help us see that. Pray that you would help us see that you always have more mercy waiting for those who love you and follow you. That you are always a strong cornerstone for us that we can stand on and be secure and that you are the one holding us steady. And I just thank you for that. I thank you for the goodness of who you are and that you are good towards us. Pray that we were greatly encouraged by worshiping you and reading of your word and just seeing this, the goodness of who you are. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. You can be seated. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 8 this morning. For those of you who've been with us for a while, you know that we are in the middle of a series on the book of Acts. If you are new with us this morning, you should know that it's our normal habit to take a book of the Bible and preach through it verse by verse. And that's what we've been doing in the book of Acts. We took a four-week break over Christmas to prayer our hearts for the advent of Christ. But now we are back at it, Acts chapter 8. I'm certainly thankful for the opportunity to be in the Word of God this morning. Let's pray. Father, the truth is that as some of us come in here this morning weary. I know I am. And yet we pray, as we just sang, that you would speak, Lord, that you would speak through your word and that you would build this church up, that you would help us to know the great truth of your promises, that we would cling to those promises amidst the difficulties and troubles of this world. And they are many. Oh, they are many. But we pray that your word would now comfort us and encourage us and challenge us and convict us. We pray that as we open your word to the book of Acts, that you would just speak. Lord, it is our prayer that you would give us ears to hear this morning, that we would be ready to hear from your word, that in the midst of our weariness or in the midst of our discouragement or in the midst of just the chaos of life, that you would speak and that we would have ears to hear. So please, Lord, minister to us now as we open your word to Acts chapter 8. It's in Christ's name we pray this. Amen. So I went to college in Cedar Falls, Iowa at the University of Northern Iowa, or as you may better know it, the Harvard of Northeast Iowa. And after graduating from college, I spent two years on staff with the campus ministry at that same university. So all told, I was in Cedar Falls for six years. And without question, those six years were some of the most important years of my life in terms of spiritual formation. Not only did I become a Christian my first year living in Cedar Falls, but in the years that followed, I learned what it means to actually follow Christ. And a huge part of that learning process involved the mentorship of several different men. Mark Walter shared Christ with me and then taught me how to read my Bible and how to pray. Jim Luby walked beside me and showed me what it looked like to be a Christian husband and father. And Rick Bribner challenged me to be more courageous and bold in my evangelism. And by evangelism, I just mean sharing Christ with lost people. Rick was probably in his late 30s or early 40s during my time in Cedar Falls, and he had a passion for other people to hear the good news about Jesus, and he also had a desire to equip others to do the same. And so to that end, Rick would sometimes invite me and a few of my friends to go with him as he went out and did street evangelism. Rick loved going out to public places and asking people spiritual questions with the hopes of being able to talk about Christ, thus the term street evangelism. And in particular, he loved to go to a place in Cedar Falls known as The Hill, and strike up spiritual conversation. The Hill was a bar district that was close to campus that had a ton of pedestrian traffic at all times of the day. And Rick would often go there during the early evening hours before it got too crazy and strike up with conversations as they walked, or strike up conversations with people as they walked on the hill. And on a couple of different occasions, my friends and I went with Rick as he headed down to the hill to have these conversations. And I have to say that it was an interesting experience. At some level, it was absolutely terrifying. But it was exhilarating too, and even in the end, I would say encouraging. It was surprising how often or how open people were to talking about spiritual things, and in some cases, we were able to have really long conversations about Christ. But there were definitely some strange moments too. As you might imagine, given the setting of a a bar district in a college town, not everyone who walked on the sidewalks, even if it was early evening, was at the top of their mental game. And sometimes the answers you would get were just kind of bizarre. I remember asking one girl, what are your spiritual beliefs? And she responded by telling me that she was a vegan. When I tried to get clarification, how does that connect to your spiritual beliefs? There was no clarification to be found. The follow-up answer was even more confusing than the initial one. All that to say, my time on the hill produced some interesting evangelism stories. 
and other opportunities I've had to share Christ, whether it be on the campus of the University of Colorado in Boulder or mission trips in Turkey and Taiwan, have also produced interesting evangelism stories as well. But I have to admit that none of my evangelism, sto evangelism stories come close to being as interesting as the one that we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 8. In Acts 8, 26 to 40, Philip has an evangelistic encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch. And needless to say, it is a fascinating account. There's an angel involved. The Holy Spirit plays a prominent role as well. There's a conversation that takes place in a chariot in the desert. And there's a somewhat mysterious ending too. Most importantly, there's a dramatic conversion and baptism that takes place also. So as far as evangelism stories go, it's a tough one to top. But what I'm going to argue this morning is that Philip's evangelistic encounter with the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8 is not just meant to entertain us in the same way that maybe we'd share stories of things that have happened in the past when we've shared Christ to entertain other people. That's not the goal here. Rather, the goal in Acts 8, as is the goal in all of Scripture, is to instruct us. Now, to be sure, there are some things that happen in this account that are pretty unique and probably not likely to be repeated in our lives. Put it this way. If an angel ever directs me to have an evangelistic conversation with an Ethiopian in a chariot in the desert, I would be pretty surprised. But unique elements aside, I think there's some lessons that we can learn here that will be helpful for us, not just in our future evangelistic conversations, but more so, I think there are some lessons that we can learn that will be helpful as we try to follow Christ on a daily basis, or in some cases, as we try to figure out what it actually means to follow Christ. So that said, let's get to it then with the hope that we will see these lessons. If you're physically able to stand, I'm going to ask you to do so out of reverence for the reading of God's word. Acts 8, 26 to 40. Standing is just a simple way we can remind ourselves this is the word of God. The words will be on the screen. You can follow on that way. You can listen as I read or you can look along in your own Bibles. The passage today starts in Acts 8, verse 26, and says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. It's the word of God. You may be seated. So as I alluded to earlier, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is a striking one with some riveting details. There's an angel, there's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, an unlikely convert, a dramatic scene in a chariot, and even a mysterious ending. All of the elements of a good story are present here in Acts 8, 26-40. But again, it's not the dramatic nature of this story that I'm interested in, in this morning, so much as I'm interested in the ongoing lessons that we can learn from this story. Now, having said that, it's obvious that the dramatic details that are part of this story are not disconnected from the lessons we might learn. But I think it's important that we don't get distracted by this spectacular details to the point that we forget to see or we fail to see the lessons that God might teach us in this passage. So the question I want us to answer this morning then is simply this. What is God teaching us in Acts 8, 26 to 40? Or to ask another way, what lessons can we learn from Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? I think there are several. I think the most obvious one is this. The first lesson is simply that God is sovereign, and he sovereignly directs and guides his people. God is sovereign, meaning he's in charge of all things. He's over all things. He's orchestrating all things, and he sovereignly directs and guides his people. Now, at first glance, when you read this story, it may seem to you like the main character is Philip. Or the main character is perhaps the Ethiopian eunuch. But upon further inspection, I think it's obvious that the main character in this story is not Philip nor the Ethiopian eunuch. The main character is God. 
His fingerprints are everywhere in this passage. Now, sometimes those fingerprints are obvious, and sometimes the fingerprints are more subtle. But either way, it is clear that God is the one directing all of the events in this story. Consider first the more obvious fingerprints. Let's look at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Then verse 29. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. Once more, verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. So it's interesting that the passage begins with an angel telling Philip what to do, but then in the rest of the passage it's the Holy Spirit directing Philip. I'm not sure that we can make much of that other than to say that Luke, who's the author of Acts, clearly wants us to understand that God is the one directing Philip's actions in this passage. It's the Lord, in the form of an angel, that directs him to rise and go south. It's the Holy Spirit telling him, go over to the chariot. It's the Holy Spirit that carries him away from the Ethiopian eunuch to a new city. By the way, the language of verse 39, as I alluded to earlier, makes for a somewhat mysterious ending. Given the way the passage reads, it seems possible that Philip just vanished into thin air and then miraculously ended up in a different city. I don't think the verbiage of verse 39 necessarily implies that Philip had to disappear in a miraculous way. I think it's possible that the language is just suggesting the Holy Spirit strongly led Philip away from the Ethiopian eunuch into a new city. But either way, the point of verse 39 is clear. God was leading Philip. The language of verse 39, and for that matter, the language of verse 26 and verse 29, make it obvious. God is directing Philip in this passage. Through an angel and through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, God is orchestrating everything that happens here in Acts 8 in a very obvious way. But God's orchestration of all things is not just obvious in this passage. There are some more subtle ways that God is working too. For example, let's look again at verses 29 to 33. Verse 29, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. So the Spirit here leads Philip to go over to the chariot. And it just so happens that as he goes over to the chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. Now, as I've said before, and no doubt I will say again, the Bible is one book with one storyline. And that storyline culminates in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we can say safely that all of Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, every page points to Christ. Every page. So in that sense, the Ethiopian eunuch could have been open to any passage of Scripture. This time he would have had access to the Old Testament. He could have opened to any passage in the Old Testament, and from there, Philip could have pointed him to Christ. But the Ethiopian eunuch wasn't just open to any passage of Scripture. He was reading from Isaiah 53, which is probably the most messianic passage in all the Old Testament. By messianic, I just mean it pointed ahead to the Savior, to the Messiah that was to come. Jim read from Isaiah 53 earlier. And when you read Isaiah 53, you can't help but think, that's talking about Jesus. Isaiah 53 is clearly pointing ahead to the work of Christ. Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. So think about this. As Philip approaches the chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch just so happens to be reading his Bible. He's reading it out loud, which was customary at the time. But the fact is, he's reading the Bible. But not only is he reading the Bible, he also just so happens to be reading from Isaiah 53, which is the Old Testament passage that most clearly points to Christ. There are 929 chapters in the Old Testament, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the one chapter that Philip could have most easily pointed him to Christ through. Do you think that's a coincidence? I do not. God clearly led the Ethiopian eunuch to read that passage of Scripture at that moment. And he clearly led Philip to approach the chariot exactly as the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53. God's hidden hand of providence is all over that interaction. But God's hidden hand of providence is at work later on, too. Verses 38 and 39. Verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. 
Now, you might read verses 38 and 39 in the account of the baptism and be encouraged that the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized and stop there. And, and that would be fine. It'd be good to be encouraged by that. But I think it's worth noting the circumstances of his baptism. In particular, I think it's worth noting the setting. I want to go back to verse 26 and consider something here. Verse 26 says this. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And here's the line that's relevant. This is a desert place. So Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are in a desert. And listen, I'm not going to proclaim myself to be a desert expert, but if there's one thing I know about deserts from elementary school, it's this. They don't have much water. So for Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch to be going along a road in the desert and find some water at just the right moment that they need it in order for this Ethiopian eunuch to be baptized, that should get our attention. Again, maybe you would say, oh, it's probably just a coincidence. I don't think so. God's hidden hand of providence is at work again. So in both obvious and subtle ways, God's fingerprints are everywhere in this passage. He directs through supernatural means, like an angel. But he also directs through ordinary means, like the Bible being open to the right page, or there being water in the desert. And in all of that, we're reminded of this, that God is sovereign. And he sovereignly directs and guides his people. We may plan... And we may orchestrate all of these things in our mind as to how we think things are going to go. But God is ultimately the one who is orchestrating all things for his glory and for his purposes. Proverbs 16.9 says it this way. The heart of man may plan his way, but the Lord determines his steps. In all things, God is sovereign. He rules and he reigns. He is the king. Ephesians 1 says it this way. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. That includes evangelistic encounters in the desert, but it also includes the circumstances in your life, even the hard ones. In saying that, we need to be honest, don't we? Sometimes God's sovereignty seems like a cold comfort in the midst of the difficulties of this world. When you're sitting in a children's hospital, as we were again this week, or as you're facing some other excruciating circumstances, some of you were this week, or you have in the past, it's sometimes hard to know. How is God's sovereignty a good thing when everything in your life is falling apart? But think about this. How would it be more comforting to think that God is not in control? If God is not in control, what confidence would we have that at some point he'll be back in control? And furthermore, would that not make our trials right now be meaningless and purposeless? And think about this too. If God is eternally wise and infinitely good, is it not possible that maybe he knows something that we don't? And that perhaps he's working for an eternal purpose that we just can't see. Over the new year, excuse me, over the new year, we went back to Iowa for my sister's wedding reception. And we took our dog Burroughs with us. Now we took him in part because it's just easier to take the dog than to find a place for him to stay. But mostly we took him with us because he was due for some shots from the veterinarian. And, and in my hometown, of Sheraton, Iowa, the cost of the veterinarian is about 20% of what it is here in Fremont. I'm not even really exaggerating. So while there's some inconvenience in taking the dog, the trip to the vet alone makes it worth it. Now in our family, Tanya is typically the one who takes the dog to the vet. But this time she was busy doing stuff for my sister's wedding reception, and so, and so the responsibility of taking the dog fell on me. Now my dad was a veterinarian, so I've been to the vet's office plenty of times in my life. But I've never taken a dog before, and it was a completely different experience. From the moment we stepped through the doors, our dog was just a different dog. He was nervous, and he was scared. It's like he knew that there's something that was going to happen. In fact, he was so nervous that the moment we put him on the scale, he just peed everywhere. And then when we tried to put him on the exam table, that was like trying to haul. It was just impossible. But the shots were the worst part. When the vet put the needle in, he hated it. The minute the needle went in, his entire body tensed. He jerked his head around, all around quickly to try to figure out what is going on here. His discomfort was obvious. And even though I'm not the most sympathetic dog owner, I'll admit that, I felt bad for him. But the vet said something in that moment that stuck out to me. I, I forget if he said it to the dog or he said it to us, but he said something to this effect. He said, I wish, I wish we could help him understand what we're doing, but I don't think that's possible, is it? And he was right. No matter how eloquent the vet would have explained the situation to our dog. Now, this is what we're doing. Or for that matter, no matter how much I would have tried to explain, say, now, Burroughs, just calm down. We're trying to take care of you. It would not have mattered. There's absolutely nothing we could do in that moment to help our dog understand sticking something sharp in his neck was a good thing. He's a dog. 
He doesn't understand how shots work. All he knows is that it hurts and he doesn't like it. Because of his limitations as a dog, he cannot see the big picture. And in that moment at the vet's office in Sheraton, Iowa, I had a bit of a realization. I'm kind of like Burroughs. Now, I don't chase rabbits, you'll be happy to know. And I don't start slobbering uncontrollably every time someone mentions food, at least not normally. But like Burroughs, I have limited knowledge. And sometimes I can't see or understand the big picture either. And that means that sometimes because I don't see the plan, I just feel the pain. Sometimes God gives me a proverbial shot in the neck, and I have no idea what he's up to, and I don't like it either. But think about it this way. If there's a gap between human knowledge and dog knowledge, and there is, how much greater is the gap between our knowledge and the knowledge of an eternally existing and infinitely wise God? Here's the truth. I don't always like what God does. And like Burroughs, sometimes I just feel the pain. But this is what I know. God knows more than I do. And I know he loves us, and I know he cares. And the reason I know that to be true is because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. There is literally nothing more, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, there's literally nothing more that God could do to demonstrate his love for us other than sending his son to pay the eternal punishment that we deserve to pay. What more could he do to demonstrate that he cares for us than to send Jesus? And because he did, and because Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death, I know he's good, and I know he loves me, and I know he cares. And because I believe those things to be true with every fiber of my being, his sovereignty and his direction of all things is indeed good news, even when life is hard. The universe is not random. Our trials are not meaningless. God is up to something, and that changes our perspective on everything. Just this week, I was reading an article that talked about the increasing fear that many Americans are facing or experiencing. According to that article, more than half of Americans would say that they are afraid of what's in store in 2022. And listen, I get it. There's a lot to be afraid of right now. With increasing division in our country and an ongoing pandemic that seems like it will never go away, an economy that seems to be teetering on the brink, there are a lot of things to be concerned about. But hear this, if God is the one who's sovereign over everything, And if he's the one who's directing all things according to the counsel of his will, then we don't have to be afraid. Now listen, there's still room to grieve. There's still room to lament the brokenness of this world. In fact, I think we should. But we don't have to be afraid. And the fact that more than half of Americans are fearful heading into 2022, I think says more about our country's view of God than it does about our circumstances. In every century and in every culture, there have always been things to be afraid of. But if God is in control, we don't have to be afraid. And in this passage, we are reminded God is in control. He is sovereign and he is sovereignly directing his people towards his ends and towards his goals. Now, to be clear, I think we should say this. God's sovereignty does not imply that we just sit back and do nothing. I think sometimes when we hear of God's sovereignty, then we assume we're talking about fatalism. What's going to happen is going to happen, so it doesn't really matter what I do. But that's not what we're talking about. God's sovereignty also implies that there will be action on our part, because God doesn't just ordain the ends, he also ordains the means. In fact, I want you to notice in this passage how Philip responds to God's leading. God is sovereign, but Philip clearly sees this as an impetus to action. Look again at verses 26 and 27. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. Verses 29 and 30. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. So Philip doesn't respond to God's sovereign plan by grabbing some popcorn and sitting on the couch and saying, let's see what happens. No, instead, Philip recognizes that God's sovereign plan includes using him. So when God tells him to go to the road, he rises and he goes. And when God tells Philip to go to the chariot, he doesn't saunter over there, he runs. God's sovereignty does not preclude our action. God ordains the means as well as the ends. In this case, he didn't just ordain that the Ethiopian eunuch would come to faith. He ordained that Philip would be the one to share with him as he came to faith. God's sovereign plan often involves using us. So don't think to yourself, God is sovereign. Guess I'll just sit back and see what happens. No, instead ask this question. In his sovereign plan, 
how is God leading me to get involved? In this passage, God is the main character. Make no mistake about it. But Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are not passive. Instead, they respond to God's sovereign leadings. So embrace his sovereignty, no question. But don't use it as an excuse for disobedience or laziness. Rather, use it as a springboard for action. I think that's the first lesson that we see here with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, that God is sovereign, he sovereignly directs his people. Lesson number two, I think, is this. God's care, or God's concern for the lost, extends to people of all nations and all backgrounds. Now, obviously, there's some pretty spectacular elements here in Philip's evangelistic encounter in Acts 8, as we've mentioned before, the presence of an angel, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the mysterious ending, all of that is spectacular. But perhaps one of the most spectacular elements of the story is the person that Philip is evangelizing to. To say that the Ethiopian eunuch is an unlikely convert would probably be to understate the situation. Excuse me. At the time, Ethiopia was part of the Nubian kingdom, located in what is now modern-day Sudan. From the perspective of a first-century person living in Jerusalem, Ethiopia was the edge of the known world. And thus, the Ethiopian here represents a true foreigner. Furthermore, this particular Ethiopian was a eunuch. Eunuchs were castrated males that would often serve in royal courts in the ancient world because of their status as castrated males, and thus the belief that, the belief that they were less susceptible to certain temptations. Eunuchs would often hold positions of honor and trust in royal courts. And that was the case here, as the Ethiopian eunuch had been put in charge of all the royal treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. But while eunuchs, including this one, may have held certain positions of honor, According to Deuteronomy 23.1, they were not allowed to be full participants in Jewish worship. Thus, the Ethiopian eunuch here represents not just a foreigner from the edges of the known world, but he also represents a social outcast of sorts who would not be expected to be included in the assembly of believers, at least a full participant. Now, to be sure, we should say this. This particular Ethiopian was obviously a God-fearing man. He'd gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way back, he's reading the scriptures on his own volition. Most likely, then, he was a diaspora Jew or a Gentile who'd had significant ties to Judaism. Nevertheless, given his status as a foreigner and as a eunuch, he was an, indeed an unlikely convert. And the fact that he comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ is yet another reminder to us that God's care for lost people extends to those of all nations and all backgrounds. Listen, I don't want to sound like a broken record here. I know we just talked about this last week, about the gospel crossing racial, social, and ethnic barriers. But the fact of the matter is that the gospel crossing social, racial, and ethnic barriers is a major theme in the book of Acts. This is not the last time we are going to talk about it because it's going to keep happening. And it's significant. And one of the reasons it's a theme in the book of Acts is because it helps us to see clearly the gospel is not just for the Israelites. And it's also significant because it demonstrates to us the power of the gospel. I don't think I'm overstating the case to say that in every culture in the history of the world, the world has tended to be divided along racial, social, and ethnic lines. Whether it be the caste system in India, or genocidal episodes throughout history, or even the current division that characterizes the United States, race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status have almost always been dividing factors and not uniting factors. But the gospel of Jesus Christ overcomes those barriers. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of salvation, as Romans 1 would say, for everyone who believes, first for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. And that power is clearly on display here in the episode of the Ethiopian eunuch. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for all people everywhere, regardless of nationality or regardless of social status. And the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch here demonstrates God's heart for the lost. And it's hard for people of all nations and all backgrounds. And as his followers, I would say this. We should want to demonstrate God's heart to the world around us. Sometimes I think we're so busy trying to win cultural arguments that we forget the responsibility we have is to reflect God's heart for lost people. We should care about people of all nations and all backgrounds and all races. And we should want people of all backgrounds and races and nations to hear about Jesus. And we shouldn't just want that theoretically. But rather, in practice, this is something we should be committed to. So, for example, we should not just pray that God would help us to overcome boundaries here in Fremont, crossing social and cultural and ethnic boundaries. But we should take action to make sure that we are a part of this happening. For that matter, we should pray that God would not just 
reach the nations, but perhaps that he would use some of us. In fact, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm praying that God would raise up people from this church who would be willing to go to the nations, to the unreached peoples, that they might hear the good news about Christ and be rescued from their sin. We should not just be people who are theoretically saying, oh yeah, we want to be about lost people. Oh yeah, we want to be about the nation. Oh yeah, we want to be about crossing boundaries. But we should be people who, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, are actually taking steps to do this. We should put our theory into action. As demonstrated by the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, God's concern for the lost extends to people of all nations and all backgrounds. And that's the second lesson that we learn in this passage, but there's a third. And that's this, that the good news of the gospel demands a particular response. Now again, it's worth noting here, the Ethiopian eunuch was apparently a God-fearing man long before he met Philip. In verse 27, we're told that he'd come to Jerusalem for worship. Verse 30, he's sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah. Both of those things are significant markers to us that the Ethiopian eunuch was seeking after God and going to great lengths to do so. Traveling from Ethiopia to Jerusalem in the first century would have been no small task. It would have been costly and time-consuming and dangerous and extraordinarily inconvenient. And the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch does this tells us something of his commitment. The fact that he then proceeds to read the Bible in his chariot as he's on his way back is further evidence he is seeking after truth. So at the very least, we would say this. This Ethiopian eunuch had been significantly impacted by Judaism, and he was seriously interested in learning more. And yet, notice this. While the Ethiopian eunuch was on the right path, it's clear that Philip demands a response from him. In other words, he doesn't just say, oh, you're, you're doing good. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. No, he clearly asks him to respond in a certain way. And we see that based on what we read in verses 35 to 38. Verse 35 says this. Then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. Now, obviously, there are a lot of details missing here in verses 35 to 38. In fact, to that point, you might notice that in your Bibles, there is no verse 37. In the earliest manuscripts, verse 37 was not included. Now, When the Bible was originally written in Greek, there were no verses. But the content of verse 37 wasn't there. Probably, though, later on, because someone thought there needs to be more detail, they added a verse 37. But I think we have enough information. I think the original manuscripts would say the actual text is verse 35, 36, and 38. And I think those verses alone give us enough information to put the puzzle pieces together. Clearly, the Ethiopian eunuch understood he needed to respond in a certain way. Now, we may have questions here. Okay, well, What did Philip share with him? What exactly did he say? We're not sure, but what we do know is this. The Ethiopian eunuch understood, I need to respond. And I need to respond by being baptized. And implied in that, given everything else we read in the book of Acts, is that he would first believe and then be baptized. Baptism was not necessary for salvation in the book of Acts. It's not necessary for salvation anywhere in the New Testament. Rather, it's an outward expression of our inner belief in Jesus Christ. And our belief that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he's our only hope. And so the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch here responds to Philip's message by being baptized tells us he had put his trust in Jesus. And I think that's worth noting in the context of this passage. For both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, there was clearly an understanding that fearing God and seeking after him in a generic way were not enough. You must believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Religion does not save. Seeking after God in a vague way does not save. Only trusting in Christ can rescue us from our sin. It's only because of Christ's death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection that any of us could ever hope to be right with God. We are saved only through faith in Jesus Christ, period. And the story of the Ethiopian eunuch helps us to see this more clearly. Being religious is not enough. Being a good person is not enough. Sincerely seeking after truth is not enough. In order to be saved from your sin, you must respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. You must respond to the good news of Christ dying and saving faith. This is important for us to hear. Because the reality is that oftentimes I hear even Christians saying things like, well, if they're sincerely seeking after God, does it really matter what religion it is? Yes, it does. The only way you can be saved is through Christ's work. To be clear, the Ethiopian eunuch was doing some really good stuff. 
He was traveling to Jerusalem for worship. He was reading the scriptures. But Philip doesn't see that and say, well, just keep doing what you're doing, buddy. You're on the right track. No, instead, he presents Christ to him. He opens the scriptures and implied he asked him to respond in saving faith and then by being baptized. And some of you need to make note of that this morning. Because listen, some of you in this room right now are assuming that because you're religious, or maybe because you're here, or because you believe there's a God, or because you're a good person, that that's enough. That you'll be okay, that God will let you into heaven. But it's not. The only thing that can save you is the work of Jesus Christ. And the same goes for your family members and friends too. They won't be saved by being religious or by, be, by being a good person. It's only what Christ has done. Only by trusting in Christ can anyone be saved. As the Ethiopian eunuch reminds us, we must respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ in a particular way, by believing in Jesus Christ and then following him. So listen, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is no doubt a good one. As far as evangelistic encounters go, it's a pretty spectacular one with all of its unique details. But it's the lessons from that encounter that I want us to be thinking about this morning. God is sovereign. And he sovereignly directs and guides his people. Therefore, we don't need to be afraid. God's concern for the lost extends to people of all nations and all backgrounds. Therefore, our concern should extend to those same people. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ demands a particular response. That we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of our sins. And then we would follow him. So it's my prayer that we would take these lessons to heart then. That we wouldn't just read I, or Acts 8, 26 to 40 and think, oh, that's a cool story. But rather, that we would see this has lessons for us, and we would live accordingly. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Every week when we open it, we are blessed to be able to spend time focusing on what you would have to teach us. In the midst of the craziness of life, what we need this week and what we need every week is to hear from you. Certainly don't need my opinion or anyone else who might stand in this pulpit, their opinion either. What we need is your opinion. And what we need is your word. In fact, it's not just opinion. What you say is always truth. And so we pray that we would see your truth and we would respond accordingly today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So one of the things that we value at this church is praying, is recognizing that we need God's help to be able to do anything. And so what I want to do today to end our time together is just pray. And I want to pray specifically for this idea of the nations. We've been talking the last couple of weeks about how the gospel crosses racial, socioeconomic, and geographic boundaries. And one of the things that I think we need to be about as a church, because I think this is God's heart, is that we would have a desire for the nations. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for three things here. Um, one, I'm going to ask you to pray that our heart for the nations would grow. Matthew 28 says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That great commission should be an indication that our heart should be for the nations. That we should long for people of all nations to hear about Jesus Christ. So the first thing is, let's pray that our heart would grow for the nations. Secondly, let's pray that God would raise up laborers to go to the nations. Luke 10, 2 says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. I said this in the sermon, I'll say it again. I'm praying that God would raise up some from this church who would go. Maybe you. Maybe me. But that we would go to the unreached people's that they might hear the good news. So let's pray that God would raise up laborers to go to the nations. And finally, let's pray that the good news of Jesus Christ would spread across the globe. As you look at the world right now, it's obvious things are messed up. And the solution is nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's pray that the gospel would spread. In, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 60, Solomon prays this, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Let's pray that prayer. So three things. Let's pray that our heart for the nations would grow. Let's pray that God would raise up laborers to go to the nations. And let's pray that the nations would hear about Jesus Christ and respond in saving faith. So let's spend about five minutes here. If you want to pray that the, with the people you came with, that's awesome. If you prefer to pray on your own, that's okay too. If you'd like to journal, whatever it is, let's just spend five minutes praying here and asking that God would give us a greater heart for the nations and greater desire to see them reached. Let's pray.
Father, as we read through the book of Acts on an increasing basis, we're being reminded that you have a heart for people of all different backgrounds. As we see the gospel crossing boundaries, going from Jerusalem to Samaria, and now from Samaria to the ends of the earth, to the Ethiopians. God, we, we're grateful to be able to see your love for people of all nations in action. And we pray that you would give us a similar heart, that we would care about the person who's living in Yemen or that we would care about the person who's living in Pakistan, or that we would have a heart for the person in Indonesia, or for that matter, the person living in the Netherlands, or the person living in Belgium, or the person living in the most remote corner, or the most remote jungle, in the most desolate place on earth. God, please give us a heart for all people everywhere to hear the good news about you. Lord, we know that you care, and we know that one day, as Revelation tells us, there'll be people from every tongue and tribe and nation and language gathered around the throne worshiping, and we pray that we would have a heart that reflects your heart for that thing to happen. And so God, give us a heart for the nations, but more than just giving us a heart, give us the desire to see follow through. Give us, give us the desire to see people go, go and share the good news with Christ. Lord, we know that unless people hear, as Romans 10 says, they cannot be rescued. And so we pray that you would raise up laborers to go to the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. We pray that you would raise up some who would go to the nations. I pray that maybe some from this church would go. That they would go to the nations recognizing that there's a great need for people to be able to hear about Jesus. In a town like Fremont, you can throw a stone and hit a church. But there are some places where there are no churches for miles and miles and miles and miles. So we pray that you would raise up laborers who would go. But Lord, we also pray that your glory would fill the earth and there would be more nations that would know that through people going and through people sharing, the good news of the gospel would spread. We know that the one hope that we have in this world of there being a change in the positive direction is a revival that's brought about by your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would work and that you would work in the nation, that there would be people from every nation, even today, who are hearing about Jesus and being saved. Lord, we pray that you would do this for your glory and for the sake of your name and for our good. It's in Christ's name we pray all this. Amen. Uh, One last thing here before I read our benediction from the book of Revelation. This is a second Sunday of the month, and on the second Sunday of each month, we do take a benevolent offering. There's a basket that's located out in the foyer. Our normal offering baskets are here in the sanctuary, but there's a, a basket that's located out in the foyer. This is for people in our congregation who are just going through a hard time financially. And for that matter, if that's you, if you're going through a hard time financially, please contact us so that we can help you out. That's why we do this the second Sunday of every month. So if you're looking to give, you can do so in that basket in the sanctuary on your way out. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand here as we give our benediction from the book of Revelation. The benediction that we find today comes from verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. It says this, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a good week.